Good evening. I would like to remind everybody present that this meeting is being live streamed to the Council's online webcast channel. Also that members use the raise your hand option when you wish to speak. You will be given permission to unmute from Democratic Services. If members wish to raise a point of order, they are to do so via the chat function where Democratic Services can see it and advise me accordingly. Before we begin the meeting this evening, I would like us to remember Albert England, Baldev Singh Gill and Eddie Cool, who sadly passed away during the course of last week. Albert England was a friend to many here this evening. I'm sure, like me, the news of his passing stopped all who knew him in their tracks. I'm sure also, like me, your thoughts turned immediately to Mrs Wynne England and their family. Albert England's military career is well known. Albert was part of what was known as a combined operation with the Navy and the Army working together. In 2015, Albert was appointed to the rank of Chevalier by the French government in recognition of his service. Councillor Cathy Kent received his insignia on Albert's behalf and handed it to Albert in this chamber where he received a standing ovation. Albert was later flown to Burma where he served with honour, where he had served with honour. Back in Thurrock, both Wynne and Albert had the back were the backbone of Thurrock's Burma Star Association for many years, ensuring members had someone to turn to and support them. They were the inspiration behind the Rose Garden installed in Orsett, where annual services are still held. As well as being remembered as a distinguished veteran, Albert was also a lifelong Thurrock resident. He attended Orsett Primary School as a young boy from 1930 to the age of 11. Albert often visited school children to share the memory of his experiences in the Second World War. In 2019, Albert and Wem presented Thurrock Burma Star Association's Union Jack Standard and Shield to Orsett Primary School for longevity and safekeeping. A much loved member of Thurrock community, rest in peace Albert, you will be missed. With regard to Mr. Baldav Singh Gill, many in this chamber will know Mr. Gill as a leading member of the Sikh community in Thurrock. Indeed, Mr. Gill was president of the Gurdwara Sikh Temple in Grays, which has done so much to engage with the communities over the years, helping to teach about the Sikh religion and culture. Others will remember Mr. Gill as a familiar resident of Grays, who often seen around the town always with a welcoming smile. As well as the important leadership role he played within the Sikh community, Mr Gill sought to build stronger community networks between different faiths and between different communities, active over the years with many different organisations to consider local issues. I had many dealings with, with Baldev over the years, firstly through Thurrock Math Matters organisation and later during my time with Thurrock CVS. He will be remembered as a gentle and kind man who always made time for others. I thank our thoughts of Mr Gill's family at this difficult time. And with regard to Eddie Cole, Mr Cole, an RAF veteran known widely across Thurrock for his organisation of the Wings Appeal, which supports RAF serving members as well as veterans and their families, sadly passed away on the 23rd of January. Mr. Cole was heavily involved was heavily involved in their fundraising activities and was a member of the Thurrock branch of Rafa. He was also heavily involved with the ATC squadrons in Grays and Stanford the Hope. Whilst I only met Eddie on a couple of occasions, his amazing dedication to fundraising and supporting veterans was outstanding. 
My condolences go out to his family and friends who will be sadly missed. As many of you will know, today is Holocaust Memorial Day. So today, people around the world have commemorated Holocaust Memorial Day on the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau on the 27th of January. As with so many events, we have not been able to mark this occasion as we normally would. But many tributes have been made virtually to remember the victims of the Holocaust and further genocides, including the Jewish people and millions of others targeted due to their faith, gender, culture, ability, and sexual orientation. This year, the Holocaust Memorial Day theme is Be the Light in the Dark. This call to action encourages us all to reflect on the depths humanity can sink to, but also the ways that individuals and communities have resisted the darkness to be the light before, during, and after genocide. The first fully digital UK Holocaust Memorial Day 2021 ceremony started at 7 p.m. today and is being streamed as we speak. <coughs> I will put, be pausing this meeting at 8 p.m., which is when the ceremonial ceremony concludes so that you can join the, join the nation to enlighten a candle and put it in your window, window if you so wish. I would now like to ask Reverend Canon Darren Barlow to lead us in prayer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I too was fortunate enough to know Baladav and, and uh, of course, Albert. And uh, Albert's funeral service is going to take place on Friday the 5th of February and uh, because of the COVID restrictions on numbers uh, unfortunately there's only going to be 30 people allowed to be present but I know Wynne um, is keen for as many people as possible to be able to join so that service will be webcast from Basildon Crematorium when it's going to take place. As uh, the Mayor has mentioned today is International Holocaust Memorial Day and normally an event would have taken place in the Remembrance Gardens opposite the rectory where I live here in Greys. But of course, because of COVID, like so many other things, it's not been possible. But to great credit of Thurrock Council, uh, an online version has been edited together. So I would encourage members to, to view that because local schools are taking part and portfolio holders and the mayor so do, do find a chance to look at that. It's on the Council's Facebook page and it's on YouTube as well. 27th of January, the day when the world remembers the six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust and killed by Nazi persecution. And in other subsequent genocides in Cambodia, Rwanda, Darfur and Bosnia. And this year, the event that we've done in Thurrock uh, was at the request of the of Thurrock's Bosnian community that a piece of music might be included within the video that was compiled for today. And uh, I know that uh, the uh, uh, Bosnian community of Thurrock uh, appreciate what's been done, uh, particularly as we remembered the 25th anniversary of the genocide in Srebrenica uh, last summer uh, in July 2020. Uh, why is this all done on the 27th of January? Well, it's because it is uh, 76 years ago today when the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau, the largest Nazi death camp, took place. Why is it important that we should include this tonight? Well, Holocaust Memorial Day is a time when we seek to learn the lessons of the past and to recognise that genocide doesn't take place on its own. It's a steady process which can begin if discrimination, racism and hatred are not checked, prevented and challenged. As leaders of this community, everyone here this evening has a role to play, a role to play in standing up and challenging discrimination and the use of language which, is encourages, which encourages or legitimises hatred, division or exclusion. That's not the job of others, 
It has to be the job of all of us. So uh, a prayer, uh, a prayer written many centuries ago uh, by St. Fr St. Francis of Assisi. And maybe there's words in this prayer that we can own for ourselves this night. So let's just pray. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, so faith. Where despair and darkness, so hope and light. Where there is sadness, so joy. For your mercy and your truth's sake, we pray. Amen. Thank you, uh, Darren. I'd now like um, <clears throat> to hold a minute's silence um, just to remember um, Albert uh, Baldev and Eddie, um, and also in uh, remembrance of Holocaust Day. So, if we could have observed one minute silence, please. Thank you. I now move on to item one of the agenda, apologies for absence. I received ap apologies from Councillor Churchman, Gladwell, Haig, Lawrence and Okanade. Are there any other apologies? Moving on to item two. Councillor Kent. How can you put his hand up? He's not there. Uh, and also Councillor Kent. No, no, no. He wants to put your hand oh, oh, sorry. No, I'll... Sorry, Councillor. Yes, Councillor Kent. Councillor Fletcher sends his apologies. He's, uh, his daughter has just gone into uh, labour this, this, this evening. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Right, I now move on to item two, minutes. I move that the minutes of the meeting of the council held on the 25th of November 2020 be approved as a correct record as shown on pages nine to 28 of the agenda. <clears throat> Is that seconded? Seconded, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Is any member in disagreement with the accuracy of the minutes? The minutes are approved. Item three, items of urgent business. I have not agreed to any urgent items of business. Moving on to item four, declarations of interest. Are there any de declarations of interest to be made? No. No. I have changed the order of this, the meeting this evening and will now move on to item 10, which is a presentation by the Police, Fire and Crime Commissioner. I would like to welcome Roger Hurst, the Police, Fire and Crime Commissioner, Chief Inspector Melton and Chief Superintendent Hooper to the meeting. 30 minutes have been allocated for this item. I have allocated 10 minutes for Mr Hurst's presentation, followed by 20 minutes for members to ask questions and any concluding comments. <coughs> I would like to remind members that this is a question and answer session and not for long statements. 
I will accept one question per member, but I will not accept any supplementary questions. If time permits, I will accept further questions from those members that have already asked a question. I would now like to ask Roger Hurst to introduce the item. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Mayor. It feels slightly unfamiliar not to be standing up to do this, but I hope you'll excuse me doing it from uh, this distance. Uh, delighted to be with you this evening. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, it, uh, you've uh, given us some questions in advance, so the presentation we have this evening really attempts to focus on those, uh, and I believe that you kindly have uh, support for us in, in the chamber with someone who will move us through the slides. So if we can move on really from that introductory slide uh, onto the, the, the first of the slides that we have. I'm pleased to say today I'm supported by your local district commander, Richard Milton, uh, and by uh, the uh, Chief Superintendent, Stuart Hooper, who, um, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, very much led the investigation into the ghastly event uh, around the 39 people who died um, from Vietnam in the refrigerated truck. And I'm pleased to say that uh, that had, was a very successful operation, bringing people to justice and resulting in, in substantial uh, sentences. Uh, I think, whilst obviously we can't do anything to restore those families, uh, or, or deal with the grief that their families are feeling. Um, I think at least bringing people to justice is doing what we can for them. And uh, I, I'm very delighted to say that uh, Chief Superintendent Hooper uh, was honoured with the Queen's Police Medal by Her Majesty in the New Year's Honours list. So congratulations to him. Um, the, the, the first slide here talks uh, a bit about the trends in crime across the piece. Um, you can see what's happening this year. I would just make the point that actually um, even before these charts started, quite a chunk of what we've been doing has been working very well. The, the strategic shift towards proactive policing, problem solving, early, early intervention and prevention has started to bear fruit across the county to the extent that even before the lockdown in, um, uh, started in March, We'd already seen a reduction in overall crime, and certain crime types like burglary, theft, antisocial behaviour were actually falling quite substantially and have been doing for some time. Uh, the, the lockdown clearly has helped uh, insofar as it's been as much of a difficulty for criminals to go about their usual business as it has been for the rest of us. Um, I, that's, to me, not sufficient um, justification for, uh, for wanting to continue the lockdown for anything more than a yeah, well, certainly no longer than it, than it need to be done for the benefit of the health of the nation. The uh, sooner we can lift it, the better. But there are some trends there that we need to build on. As you can see from this slide, uh, all crime in Thurrock is now actually down by about 13% compared with the previous year. Now, that is, is quite substantial. Uh, and I think certainly uh, something that we need to, to try and bank. Uh, the, the period of the lockdown has been one where acquisitive crime has been under huge pressure, but we've also used the opportunity to deal with organised crime uh, and drug-related violence uh, and clamp down on quite a number of the county lines that have been operating in, in the county. Yeah, they're difficulties we've exploited and put them out of business. And I think that's something that we need to make sure that we, we stay on top of uh, as we go through the, the year to come, frankly. Uh, where I hope we'll see a massive recovery in society and the economy, uh, but not that same recovery uh, in crime at the same time. Of course, a chunk of that success is down to the investment that we've made in policing over the last few years, very much with your support. Um, I know that you've been a great partner through that, and very much with the support of your residents, because the first couple of years of that were really entirely done by funding from the council tax precept. Uh, now we have support from central government this year, uh, but of the 500 extra cops that we now have compared with where we were three years ago, um, we about 380 of those actually have been funded by, by council taxpayers in this county. Uh, and that's made a big difference. Uh, we now are hiring an extra 135 this year, largely with the support of central government. Uh, and next year, I'm about to announce a budget, um, give you a sneak preview. Um, I think the papers went out to the police and crime panel today, uh, but we will be investing in another 184 officers in the year ahead 
six of those for the regional uh, organised crime unit. The rest will be deployed here in Essex. And of course, you in FERC will, will see the benefit of that, both through the disruption teams we're putting together, the increased resource we're putting into dealing with domestic abuse perpetrators, and the increased resource we're putting into um, serious violence unit uh, dealing with organised crime and drug-related violence. Uh, so there's, there's a lot going on there. But I think, you know, just this snapshot gives you a good picture of the success that we're having here in Thurrock, bringing crime down. And as you can see from the text, uh, pretty much uh, nearly twice the force average. Um, so we're, we're doing better here. The resources committed here are making a difference. And I guess uh, that's my opportunity to commend uh, Chief Inspector Melton. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Next slide, please. Uh, this gives you a sense of where we are in terms of the commitment of resources here in Thurrock. Um, a quick summary of, of, the, of the teams that we have in, in local policing response teams, uh, in community policing teams. You, of course, have your town centre team now, which I think is, is, is working well. Uh, and we also have, specifically operating in the district, child abuse teams, adult sexual abuse teams, and a team managing the... the sex offenders and violent offenders that we have in, 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 the, in the area as well. Um, that's, as I say, a substantial commitment of resource. The community policing team, I think, is about doubled over the last couple of years, uh, and there's been a substantial increased investment in local policing as well. And of course, the special constabulary has grown phenomenally, um, which, again, thank you for your support in making that happen. Uh, so we can just move on to the next slide, please. I'm conscious of that I don't have much longer to actually uh, present this to you, uh, but, uh, in terms of violence and vulnerability, a really important work stream for us. This is really where we work in terms of making sure that the wicked drug gangs, organised crime gangs that operate cannot prey or have difficulty in preying on the young people in, in your area. Uh, and that is something that, that we coordinate through the Violence and Vulnerability Unit, uh, which has the support of central government. Uh, we have about a million pounds of a, a year of funding from them. Um, we also actually have support from Essex County Council, uh, 500,000. Um, we, uh, we're always under pressure for them to make sure that we spend it in the county area, but I can assure you that it actually goes across the whole policing area uh, and, and does make a difference. Here you can see what we've been doing locally to promote uh, local groups that work with young people uh, and help keep them out of trouble. It's diversionary activity. It's specific support for troubled kids. Um, and you can see that we've actually given grants to some of your local organisations uh, and developed a, a better understanding uh, around the shape of the issue here and working with the Domestic Abuse Board, well, sorry, no, with, with the Violence and Vulnerability Unit uh, to make sure that we have youth services across the entire policing area that are working, working for you here in Thurrock as well. So um, three of those targeted locations are actually here in Thurrock. Uh, we have detached youth workers funding in three areas of Thurrock through Red Balloon. And we are working with a firm, an organization called DotCom uh, to make sure that we're providing support to community groups as part of uh, the approach to localities. So if we can, I think, move on again to the next slide, um, please. My screen hasn't moved. Have I lost you? No, we, can, we can still hear you, Roger. <laughs> all right, okay. I didn't know whether you'd all frozen or whether it's just the slides that have frozen. Um, rather than wait for the slides to progress, I might just do the talking, if that's all right. So the next slide is actually about operations sector. Uh, which is uh, a again part of the um, the action that we have to tackle gangs and serious violence. This is really the local surge activity. Um, so, with uh, again over a million pounds of, of central government funding, and I think, think the point about dealing with violence and vulnerability is really a three pronged three pronged attack. One is protecting people, which was the last slide. The second is stepping up our local activity, which is this slide. And the third is actually working with the Metropolitan Police and with West Midlands Police to make sure we chop the head off a snake and deal with the, the people who lead uh, the, these difficult gangs. 
So Operation Wildcat here in, in your area is part of Operation Sector. Um, and we also have Operation Gambler here, which is a cross-border operation with the Met. Um, that is regularly focusing on the borders with London, targeting prolific offenders and taking out those people we know and are wanted for weapons, drugs and theft of motor vehicles. Over 200 people actually arrested across 19 operations so far. Uh, Operation Marshall targets a smaller proportion of people who commit the majority of crime. Uh, and that, again, is focused on repeat offenders. Uh, and again, we're, it's not just uh, the drugs offenders, it's also uh, violent domestic abuse offenders at the same time. Again, somewhere where we work together with the Metropolitan Police. Uh, and uh, we've also had some very focused work with our Operational Policing Command, who I often think of as the, uh, the big cops. Um, they're, they obviously are the intervention unit uh, that, that we use, dealing with, uh, with organised crime groups in your area. Uh, that's been various operations, for instance, uh, Operation Calypso, uh, which is around road crime and road safety, uh, as well as working together with Opceptor and Op Produce, which is a national knife crime initiative uh, dealing with knife crime and gangs and county lines. Um, so a lot happening here as well as across the county. If I can also move on to uh, slide six, please. This is the other big high harm crime, really, and I'm sure you'll be very well aware of it uh, here in, 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 in your area. Domestic abuse actually results in about a third of the, of the homicides in the county. Uh, it is an abhorrent crime. It, it results in a lot of the violence as well. Here in, in Thurrock, we have uh, Operation Shield 2, which is a trial operation targeting repeat high-risk and violent domestic abuse offenders. Actually, we, we, I think we've got some pretty much cutting-edge um, interventions here around domestic abuse. Uh, we, we did a great pilot uh, up in Colchester, uh, which proved its worth, called Drive, which reduced reoffending by those targeted offenders uh, by about 80%. We're rolling that out across the county. We're doing more of the same stuff here in Thurrock now. Um, and we're also looking to support victims better. We've done a lot of that over the last few years. I'm sure you're aware a lot of resources put into making sure that the victims of domestic abuse are well supported, feel they can come forward, feel they will be listened to, are listened to and are protected. Um, now, there are some who find it difficult to go to the police for obvious reasons uh, around the, the threat to their, their personal safety, but also around the emotional environment in, in which they live. And we, we need to help work with them to help them understand, well, we need to understand why they're not supportive of police action and improve our processes to make that happen. And that's very much happening here in Thurrock at the moment. Um, so. Yeah, there's a lot more going on in that sort of area. It is one of the areas we'll be investing in quite substantially over the next year as well, and making sure that we do more, because it, it accounts for over 40,000 offences across the county out of the 150,000 we have in total. That's a huge chunk um, of the levels of, of crime in the county, and a lot of the victims, and a lot of those victims are vulnerable people whom we need to support. Um, if I can move on to slide seven, conscious that I probably only have about a minute left, I think. Um, slide seven is uh, about the Ports Watch. That, again, is, is very much an a, a, a initiative relevant to you here in Thurrock, um, really responding to the issues that, that we saw last uh, two years ago now, or the, the year before last, rather. Uh, and better sharing and joint operations between uh, port and port and partners. Um, I know we have a, a very good relationship with, with the uh, Port of London uh, police in the Port of Tilbury. I've been down there myself in, in September, seeing what a good job they do. Um, but we're also working very closely with the Border Force, um, working well with the, the, the Ports Police in the other, other areas, um, allowing unsupervised patrol around our ports, 
uh, and allow the ports to have more eyes on the ground and at sea. Uh, and there have been a number of enforcement days of action around the Thurrock ports, uh, working with immigration enforcement and the other partners. Uh, and of course, there are, there are good voluntary groups that you have uh, active in your area around the ports as well, which we're, we're happy to support. The, uh, the next slide, slide eight, I think is just something that you particularly asked about, which is how we managed to improve access to policing, particularly via 101. And I would just point out there that the average wait times four years ago here were around 29 minutes. Um, we've changed that. We're now in the sort of situation where the, the 101 response is, even if you include both the control room response and the resolution centre, we're actually um, under eight minutes, under seven minutes, I think, on, on, on average at the moment. That's a heck of an improvement. That's been partly to do with investment and improving the uh, technology in the area, and partly to do with um, a switch to online reporting, which has worked really well. You've got some stuff on there about the live chat. Please do use it. It's a really useful service uh, between 7 a.m. and 11 p.m., very effective. And I think people who use it have found it a very good way of, of making progress. I think the last slide actually is just the, the, the next step slide. Um, so where we're focused going forward, as I've said, tackling gangs, drug driven violence, that's somewhere where we have a lot more to do. Similarly, domestic abuse. We are concerned that there will have been a lot of domestic abuse during lockdown, which will not have been reported for obvious reasons. We need to make sure that we are there supporting those victims and, and helping pick up the pieces together with your social services when the lockdown lifts and these people feel they can come forward. And of course, as I've said before, working really well with you around prevention activities, particularly in the community safety partnership. So um, problem solving interventions, hotspots, persistent offenders and vulnerable individuals, very much the focus of that activity. Thank you very much, but we need to go to questions, please. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Roger. Moving over to uh, questions. Uh, first question is from Councillor Spillman. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. Um, in, in terms of the domestic violence, um, I mean, you've stolen a, a lot of the questions I was going to ask for, through, through the report, so thank you for that. Um, but what have been the main challenges um, that you've faced as a force regarding domestic violence during this pandemic? And, and what changes have you made to operational practice to meet those challenges? So I think uh, I'll have a shot at this and then I, I may hand over to uh, probably the, the Chief Inspector uh, uh, to get a more detailed response. But it's been something we've been very alert to and we've tried really hard to, to make ourselves accessible. So working very closely with the charities. Um, there is the um, recently launched national initiative called ANI, -E, which is a way of helping people um, report through less obvious means, including places like pharmacies. Uh, we've launched our J9 project, which is intended to help other people understand how to spot the signs of domestic abuse uh, and report it. And we're, 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 yeah, that's an education program, I think, rather than a training program, but it's something which we hope is is going to be really useful. Of course, we've advertised, we've used social media, but let's not pretend that that's a proper replacement. It, 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 is, it has to be difficult. Uh, but uh, Richard or Stuart, do you want to come in? I don't know if you can, I don't know how the technology works. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Can you hear me? It's uh, Richard here. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So just to follow up, obviously, we've got the initiatives there that uh, the Commissioner mentions. We need to find in this modern era um, a way to obviously either predict um, those that could potentially be at risk or give other platforms for victims to come forward to us, especially in this digitally uh, enabled era that we're in. 
Um, but one of the things that I'll highlight locally, which we've now uh, rolled out across the whole county now, as uh, it was in your briefing pack, is Operation Shield. And what Operation Shield does is it basically takes the behaviour of a risk perpetrator um, and through um, some technology in terms of analytics um, and things that we know about their previous offender behaviour and also other offences that they commit um, can actually give a fairly accurate indication that that person is going to cause harm again. So it's now incumbent on us as statutory bodies to come forward um, and in effect try and work uh, around prevention uh, before it does become a problem. Um, and in terms of giving better platforms for victims to come forward, that's something that has got to be a piece of ongoing work, as the Commissioner mentions, uh, and something that, that is really important for the rest of the UK to come on board with. We do know how difficult it is to break the chain of domestic abuse, um, but we're absolutely committed to making sure that we deal with not only the perpetrators of domestic abuse, but we give the victims every opportunity to come forward and break that chain themselves. Um, and as I said, the, the uh, initiatives mentioned uh, are certainly very good for that. We are mindful and we will keep a weathered eye on what happens when lockdown finishes, because I think it's a reasonable assumption to say that actually it is more difficult to report domestic abuse at the moment because the families are obviously committed to the same building. Um, you know, lockdown means that actually there are less choices for victims in terms of how they escape that abusive relationship. So we will keep a very close eye on what it looks like when lockdown starts to finish. Thank you. Just like everybody, remind everybody that this item will actually finish at 19.58. So if we can keep our uh, questions and responses um, succinct. Moving on to the next question, which is from Councillor Redsill. Councillor Redsill. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Commissioner, for that. Um, motorbikes are probably on your low priority at the moment, but in Thurrock, and I'm sure many other boroughs, we've got a big motorbike problem. Um, it's getting worse. Um, some of the perpetrators are drawing knives on residents. Um, all the things have been reported, but just wondered what you can do to help us deal with this. I know you've done a great deal of work and I know you've taken a lot of motorbikes away, but I think we know where they're coming from. If perhaps police officers could liaise more with members, um, we can give you so much information um, from this, which we're getting back from our residents. It's, it's beginning to be more of a problem in lockdown than it probably ever has because there's no one about to stop them. And I think they're just um, causing more trouble. I just wondered what you can, more you can do to help us. And I know it's on a bit of a low priority, but where um, knives are being Yeah, thank used, you. Thank you, Joy. If you could just answer me that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Red. So I, I just I don't think it really is a low priority. Road crime actually is 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 a big priority for us. One of one of the key things, and and we we know how much harm it causes. But I think in terms of the local solution, if I may. District Commander Melton, may I hand back to you? Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, indeed. Uh, and Councillor, again, I can reassure you it's not a low priority. Um, and the reason being is because, um, rightly so, it's brought up by yourselves as councillors, um, you know, many, many times throughout my working week. Um, and I know that it is a blight on Thurrock. So to give you a very short answer, um, it is a priority for us. We've done some really good work under Operation Caesar with uh, yourselves on the council, um, jointly funded operations, which I'm very keen to continue. Um, we uh, continue to tackle nuisance motorbikes. We do realise there's more work to do. There definitely is. Um, and in terms of us sharing information with you, um, we'll make sure that we do that through our community safety engagement officers. But my plea to you is also to make sure that you keep giving us the information as well so we can be in the right place at the right time to get these motorbikes off your streets. Thank you. Councillor Muldowney. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mr Hurst, for your presentation. Um, we're about to see in a report coming up from Councillor Gledhill that the ward that I represent, Chadwell St Mary, has, has gone against the grain and recorded the greatest increase in incidents of antisocial behaviour. Almost a quarter more reported to Essex Police this municipal year so far. Can you tell me what additional police presence or other services 
can the residents of Chadwell St Mary expect to see over the coming year? There again, I think I have to hand back to the district commander who's very much in charge of that operational uh, element. Yes, thank you. So uh, you're right, uh, there has been a significant increase in antisocial behaviour um, in some of the wards and Chadwell certainly being one of them as well. Uh, attributed to three things really. Uh, one, there has been a natural uh, increase in some antisocial behaviour. But there is a lot of uh, COVID reporting that goes down as recorded as antisocial anti behaviour, um, because that's how our recording system works rightly when uh, people are doing the right thing and reporting people for breaching COVID, uh, neighbours for breaching COVID, etc. So um, a lot of that is, is now uh, included in your figures. And of course, the third thing that you see at Chadwell is, as we've discussed, uh, motorbikes. Uh, and again, rightly so, your residents are reporting that. Uh, what are we going to do about it? Well, uh, indeed, we're making sure that the community policing team are fully up to strength, which they are now. Um, we'll make sure that we have proactive patrols, certainly under Op Caesar, but also generally uh, around ASB reduction in Chadwell and indeed across all the districts as well. Uh, and I will make sure that we keep a very close eye on, on, on that issue going forward. But I hope to see your ASB come back under control and it is one of our focuses. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ralph, would you like to ask your question, please? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'd like an update on the Town Centre Police, if you could. Um, I understand that the Stanford Hope Town Centre Police will be rolled out to Coronham as well. Um, I know we've had a bit of issue with Stanford, the police not being available because there's been maybe shortages or other more important things they've been dealing with. But I wonder if you could give me an update on the position of when we will see the Town Centre Police in Coronham. You're, you're, you're asking good detailed local questions here. I'm really glad I've got the district commander with me. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. I'll, I'll certainly take that one. Uh, yeah, Grays Town Centre teams, uh, South Hockingdon, Stanford, Perfleet and Tilbury are the established teams, as you know, and has been re reported uh, at full council before. Um, we have had ongoing discussions around Corrigan. Uh, I know some very vibrant discussions uh, on a number of occasions around the policing of Corrigan. Uh, first of all, I can assure you that there are discussions taking place with regards to uh, the viability of extending the Stanford Lee Hope uh, to Corrigan, and I hope to update you uh, about those discussions shortly either way. Uh, but in terms of what the town centre teams are there to do, um, we are fully resourced, fully staffed. We've got four additionally funded town centre team uh, officers as well uh, that cover Perfleet and Tilbury. Um, and I'm going to make sure that going forward uh, through the community safety engagement officer, again, we um, highlight exactly how many hours they're spending in your town centres. Um, and there's already uh, a matter of public record. Unfortunately, I don't have the stats in front of me right now, but exactly what they're getting up to in your town centre teams as well and the effect they're having. Um, so uh, it's subject to a post-implementation review, which I know uh, obviously the Commissioner will uh, have had sight on and oversight of, um, the town centre teams really are doing what we want them to do and I really want them to be even more visible uh, 2021 going forward. As you say, we expect a very real success story and we want to build on them. Thank you. Uh, going on to Councillor Jeffries now, I understand you have a question. Councillor Jeffries. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Commissioner, for your report. Thanks in part to the funding from this administration, South Ockenden has seen the number of police officers rise from one to five over the last 12 months. So thank you, Commissioner. However, in 2019, two push bikes were delivered to the South Ockenden Police Station from the council. The reason for them not being used was that they needed servicing and then it was that the police officers need to pass their cycling proficiency test. I'm assuming these cycles have now been serviced and the officers have successfully passed their cycling proficiency test. So will the commissioner and the chief inspector give my residents the assurance that these police bikes will be used and in evidence and visible policing will come back to South Hockenden? Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Councillor Jeffries, uh, and thank you for the gift of the push bikes. That's the first thing to say. Um, 
I wasn't aware that they weren't being used. So I think, again, I need to hand on as a matter of detail to the operational commander. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, yes, uh, in simple answer, um, we are aware that Ockenden has had some challenges over the last couple of months. We have seen an increase in offences committed there. We've seen antisocial behaviour increase as well in Ockingdon, uh, albeit still in line with where we uh, where we are seeing an overall crime reduction across the district. Um, so it's not lost on me, Councillor, uh, and I will make sure that um, we continue to be visible in your communities, both through the town centre team, uh, but also uh, to dust off those bikes as well. An issue that hadn't been brought to my attention before, so I'll look at it. Um, one thing I would say is that we have had some superb results of late at Ockingdon with regards to uh, an ongoing series of damage that you've had to your CCTV system. Um, and I'm really glad that we've brought two offenders to justice for that. So um, certainly not overlooking Ockingdon. Uh, you, you know, you are getting the focus right that you deserve. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Byrne, do you have a question? Your question, please. Councillor Byrne. Yes, got me. Uh, yeah. Uh, can I ask why you watered down our crime report? For example, shop, shoplifting with threats of a lethal weapon. In our report, is logged simple case of shoplifting. Our forum meeting, we were told, if we told a full story to residents, it would scare them. So this may be why crime is down, because you're not reporting the full story. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Councillor. I, I can assure you that we are reporting the full story. It's very much uh, the, the sort of thing that the Her Majesty's Inspectorate takes very seriously. Uh, and we are regularly inspected on the accuracy of our crime data reporting. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that uh, I think I'm, I'm, I think it was about the, the top rating in the country, frankly. Uh, Chief, Chief Superintendent Hooper might put me right on that, but I've, I know that we got an outstanding rating uh, and that we got over 95% score for the accuracy of our crime data reporting. If you have a specific incident, uh, I know that you've raised the, the, the issue of uh, armed robbery uh, in, as, instead of shoplifting. Um, I think we need to make sure we look into that properly. And I know that that has been reported and I think has been checked up on. I don't know if uh, either of the two senior officers we have with us want to follow up on that particular case. I don't have that answer for you. Uh, it is for them to do that. But, um, yeah, obviously, shoplifting is not something that you do at knife point. Chief Inspector? Yes, thank you, Commissioner. So in terms of that particular example, we have looked into it. Um, simply put, national crime recording standards do not allow us to water down crime figures. Um, so I can tell you with a great deal of assurance that that is not happening. Uh, and also, Her Majesty's Inspectorate have looked at how we do our crime recording. If there was a shoplifting that occurred with uh, an offensive weapon or a deadly weapon, as you put it, that wouldn't be a shoplifting, it would be a robbery. Um, and the very definition of legislation would tell us that. So I can assure you, um, and we have looked into it, that we are not changing our crime figures uh, to water down the story, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Allen, you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, and good evening to the virtual chamber. Uh, again, I'd like to touch on the antisocial, uh, unlicensed motorcycle use in Tilbury. Uh, I'd just like some assurance, please, from yourself, Roger, and you, Richard, uh, that you uh, will tighten patrols to tackle uh, this, this behaviour. Uh, and could you please emphasise on how you do plan to tackle these uh, these unlicensed unli motorcycles, please. Just for clarification, if I may, are you referring to e-scooters or e-bikes as, as unlicensed motorcycles, or are these actually high-powered petrol bikes? Thanks for thanks for that, Roger. Uh, yes, I, I witnessed something myself, Roger, uh, in Calcutta Road by. Uh, by the main shops where uh, an elderly pensioner was crossing the actual crossing and a high-powered motorcycle, a, uh, a track bike, uh, performed a wheelie and just missed the old lady 
crossing the crossing. I absolutely closed my eyes, gritted my teeth and went, God, no. And okay. he just missed the old lady, the elderly lady. So uh, we need some action down there because it's only going to be a matter right, of time thank, before thank, we thank see you, thank a you, fatality. Can, thank you, Councillor Owen. Thank you. Sorry, I, I probably held us up there, Mr. Mayor, by asking for clarification, but I, I, it was helpful. Um, so I can re absolutely assure you that um, road crime is something that we take seriously, as I said before, and we will commit resources to it. Again, I probably ought to hand back to the Chief Inspector for the detail about what we can, what we can do around Calcutta Road. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it comes back to the point we made earlier that we do recognise that the motorcycles are a real uh, blight on Thurrock. Um, so because of that, it has my focus. Op Caesar, uh, we've got some, uh, which I won't discuss in the open forum, but we've got some tactics that we use to try and catch these motorcyclists. Uh, they are naturally quite hard to catch because obviously um, they have the agility and uh, very often go off road, especially in the Tilbury area. Um, but it does have our focus we will work with uh, the council going forward uh, with regards to the joint funded operations um, and at every opportunity, as long as the calls keep coming in from your constituents, we will try and plot ourselves in the right place to deal with it as they occur. And we have had some good results um, and when we, will, uh, we, we have seized 58 motorcycles in the last year. Um, we've arrested seven people. We've given out a number of uh, antisocial uh, driving notices as well. So we do deal with them when we catch them. We just need to be called. Perhaps we just need to make sure we report that well through the Community Safety Partnership and get it back to members. Thank you. Councillor Holloway. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, just a, a couple of things. First of all, um, you mentioned about questions in advance. I think this is a question for democratic services or officers. I certainly didn't have the opportunity to pose any questions in advance, so I'd appreciate an answer to that after the meeting from officers. Secondly, um, I'm quite concerned that you suggested lifting the lockdown um, with regards to COVID. I think you should know that obviously Thurrock has still got very, very high numbers. Nationally, we know that we should be continuing the lockdown for the foreseeable. Very concerned that you suggest lifting it. But my question is with regards to the tragedy that you mentioned that happened in my ward with regards to the lorry where these the, the Vietnamese people were found in West Thurrock. What are you doing in partnership with other agencies to make sure this never happens again and that no one indeed is trafficked through our ports in Thurrock? Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Holloway. And, and just in case there was any misunderstanding there, uh, I am not recommending that the lockdown be lifting, lifted, and I'm certainly not in a position to make a decision that the lockdown be lifted. Um, I think we need to see the vaccine rolled out and we need to see the number of people being infected come down and we need to see the numbers going into hospital massively reduce. I look forward to that happening enormously. Uh, and that is when the lockdown needs to be lifted, not before. Uh, and if I was misunderstood, I apologise for that. Around the partnership with other agencies, I, I tried to say a bit about that uh, in, in the presentation. Uh, we are working much more closely uh, than heretofore with the Border Force and with the Immigration Services. But we have the resident expert on this with us this evening, uh, Chief Superintendent Hooper, and I think I should probably hand over to him to give you chapter and verse on, on how that's working. Stuart, are you there? Evidently, he's not shown up as being in attendance. I, I think he was down as Sue Hooper. Councillors uh, uh, and uh, Commissioner, more than happy to take that on Mr Hooper's behalf. Please do, Richard. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. Councillor Holloway, thank you for the question, because it really does highlight uh, an incredibly important issue for policing in Thurrock. Um, in, in short, the answer to your question is, what are we doing um, a heck of a lot? Um, we've recognised that a tragedy like this cannot be allowed to happen again. Um, yes, we've prosecuted for it and a fantastic result, um, albeit in tragic circumstances, to bring those people to justice. Um, but what we now do uh, is, is, is many different layers. But basically, we now have Ports Watch, which is now um, uh, in effect where professionals once a month get together and start sharing information. Uh, more about that shortly. Uh, but we also have Ports Watch set at the non-government organisation and volunt uh, voluntary sector level, so they can discuss issues in the Thurrock area, share intelligence, share information. 
We also have ports watch at the industrial and commercial level as well. So port operatives can actually report into things that they're seeing within the confines of the ports themselves. Um, in terms of how the professionals now talk, uh, we have the Ports as a Community project, which is a project um, between ourselves, Immigration Enforcement and Border Force, where we're bringing together a multi-agency task force, which will share all the information across all platforms that we've got to do multi-agency uh, proactive operations, uh, but most importantly, look to try and uplift our resourcing into tackling the organised crime groups that sit behind this. There is no immigration crime that does not get driven or funded or coordinated by uh, anybody else except organised crime groups. So that is where we want to focus our activity. So going forward, certainly in the last uh, 12 months and definitely going forward 21 to 22, you will see a significant and focused multi-agency response to prevent tragedies like Operation Melrose ever happening again. Thank you. Uh, bearing in mind it's now five to eight and we'll be um, taking a recess at eight o'clock to allow those members um, that wish to take part in the Holocaust uh, Remembrance um, lighted candle. Um, I'm afraid I haven't got time for any more questions. So, Roger, I'll allow you five minutes or four minutes if you can sum up um, and thank you uh, for attending. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry if we if we haven't gotten to some of your questions. Uh, and actually, if you want to submit them via Democratic Services, we will pick them up and deal with them and get back to you. Uh, but I, 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 I would really appreciate it as well if I may stay on when I finish speaking and just be part of your of your candle lighting. That would that would be something I would personally appreciate. Um, I hope we've managed to give you a bit of an insight today into what we are doing both countywide and here in your borough and in, in collaboration actually with, with police services across the border as well uh, to, to make sure that you are safer. Clearly you've been very helpful in raising specific issues. Um, I've certainly taken copious notes. Uh, I'm sure that, uh, that, that Richard will have taken, the Jimmy Swift will have taken some as well uh, and I know that my colleague uh, Darren will have, will, have, will have taken them. So we will make sure that we follow up on the issues that you've raised and I think we know from the conversations we had with you in the past that uh, we, we managed to do quite a bit of what you've suggested to us. Um, sadly, not everything, because some of it is actually uh, quite hard and quite a wicked problem to solve. But we will continue to invest in policing across the county. We will continue to invest in your area to help make sure that you're safer. I think the key things over the next couple of years have to be to see more problem solving policing working on hotspots, working around known offenders, working around vulnerable people with your community safety partnership. You know, we, we need to work as a hub on this and make sure that we are doing it together in partnership. That is how we get the best leverage, how we get the best intelligence on where we need to act and focus our resources to stop stuff happening in the first place. That's how we bring crime down. So at that note, I think I'm exactly at 1958, which is when the, Mr. Mayor said I needed to, to stop speaking. I will just say thank you to you all for your attention and thank you all for the partnership working that you do with us. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for all your attendance. Uh, yes, obviously you're welcome to stay um, until after eight o'clock. Um, we're going to take just a short break now um, till two minutes past eight to allow us, those members that wish to light a candle um, to do so. Um, I'm not going to take off the live streaming, that will carry on, but uh, we'll resume again at two minutes past eight. I think we've got two minutes to go to eight o'clock when uh, is the uh, time that uh, throughout the nations, those people that wish to light candles will be doing so.
but I would now like to resume with agenda item five, which is announcements on behalf of the Mayor and Deputy Leader of the Council. I would like, like to ask all to make, take a moment and remember Thurrock's Fallen of World War II, on, as seen on page seven of the agenda. Those being Henry G. Beadle, Edward J. Pritchard, William Stewart Ritson, John V. C. Goldsmith, Jeremiah Clark, that was December 1940, January 1941, Derek Hocking, June Totley, Charles Lu Lucy Allen, Frederick J. Stevens, Doris Aldwinkle, George Aldwinkle, Kenneth Aldwinkle, Alan Aldwinkle, Joseph Ems, Sarah Ems, Leslie Donald Knight, and George Thomas Wisby. Thank you. I now move on to um, a few announcements that I'd like to make. Uh, I would like to start once again by thanking all those who are continuing to work through this pandemic to ensure that vital services are maintained wherever possible. Whether this be shop workers, medical staff, the police, refuge collectors, etc. And also the voluntary sector who are playing an important role in keeping in contact and supporting the more vulnerable in Thurrock. Thank you all. As I have not been able to attend the functions that my role as Mayor would normally require, I have continued to make small donations to local voluntary groups to enable them to carry on with the support they are giving to local people. I sincerely hope that before the end of my time as Mayor, I will once again be able to visit some of the voluntary groups to express our gratitude for all they have done over the last year. Moving over now to uh, Councillor Hebb, would you like to make a statement on behalf of the uh, Leader of the Council? Good evening, Mr Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You can, brilliant. Right, good evening. Um, Mr Mayor, thank you. Uh, I'm sure the whole chamber uh, joins you in paying tribute to a number of individuals who, who while may have left us, have very much left Thurrock, better place than perhaps how they found it, and all of us clearly have much to thank them for and to remember them. And, and clearly there's also best wishes that need to be extended to Councillor Fletcher and his family, and I'm sure the whole chamber um, give every best wish uh, to the uh, right head and wish them well. Mr Mayor, I've just got a few updates on behalf of Councillor Glitz Hill, who is unfortunately poorly this evening, uh, and very much specifically around COVID-19. The rate of the infection in Thurrock is moving in the right direction in all age groups, but we are quite clearly not out of the, the woods yet. We are in fact still very much in the grip of more infectious variants, which has led to this huge Sorry, Councillor Hebb, we're, uh, you're breaking up. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Um, so it's obviously now more important than ever that we make sure that we do everything that we can do personally to stop the spread of the virus, protecting our NHS and saving lives. The simple truth is that we will have to act like we have COVID-19 and that anyone we meet has it may well have it too. By following hands, face, space, advice, practicing social distancing and taking extra care to look out for one another. That will have an active role in defeating this virus. Those who seek to bend or break the rules not only pose a risk to themselves, their loved ones, uh, but our communities as well. Uh, they hinder our chances of leaving national lockdown and being able to go back to more relaxed restrictions when the time is right. Mr Mayor, in terms of vaccination, tonight we heard that one eighth or uh, every eighth 
adults in the country have now had their first vaccine. Vaccinations are being given to groups identified by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation as being the most at risk. This includes those living and working in the borough's care homes, those aged 80 and over and then the, those aged 70 and over, and those who, are, of course, are clinically extremely vulnerable. The residents and staff in our care homes are being given vaccines right now, while vaccines are also being delivered to other priority groups across the borough through the Borough 2 vaccine centres at the Chadwell Medical Centre and the Stiffer Clays Health Centre. Plans are also being put in place to ensure that all housebound residents will be visited and given their vaccine at home. And the key message here is that there is no need for people to call their doctor. You will be notified directly by the NHS. There is no charge for the vaccine and the NHS will never ask you to share bank details to confirm your identity or pay a vaccine. Unfortunately, there are those that seek to take advantage for the wrong reasons of the situation. And it is important for those who have had the vaccine, of course, to remember that it can take up to three weeks before after the first injection for the body to develop that protection from that first dose. So during the three week period, indeed after it as well, you must continue to take the same precautions to avoid either infecting yourself or passing on this virus to others. And Mr. Mayor, just to, to close off, uh, just a couple of uh, comments around the Tilbury Town Fund bids. Uh, the leader wants me to, to share with members that the bids for the Towns Fund programme, which could potentially lead to 50, billion, uh, 50 million pounds in government funding to improve Greys and Tilbury, have now been sucked submitted by their respective town boards. These town boards, led by local business community partners and community leaders, have developed the bids to address issues which have the potential to significantly enhance the two towns and we will await the outcome clearly with a lot of interest. Fraser has already been awarded £750,000 to kickstart works, including the new outdoor play and sports area at Grays Beach, while Tilbury has been awarded uh, £500,000 from the, the town's fund. Mr Mayor, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Deputy Leader. Moving on to item six, questions from members of the public. We've, we've no, no questions have been received from members of the public. Moving on to item seven, petition from members of the public and councillors. Please be advised that in accordance with the council's petition scheme, no notices of petition were received. Item eight, update report in respect of those petitions presented at full council and council offices. This report can be found on pages 31 to 32 of the agenda and is information on the status of petitions handed in at council meetings and council offices. offices. Item 9, appointments to communities and outside bodies, statutory and other panels. Councillor Hebb, do you wish to make any changes to the appointments previously made? No changes, Mr Mayor, thank you. Councillor John Kent, do you wish to make any changes to the appointments previously made? No. Sorry, Councillor Byrne, do you wish to make any changes to the appointments previously made? No, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Massey, do you wish to make any changes to appointments previously made? No, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. And Councillor Rannan, do you wish to make any changes to the appointments previously made? No changes, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Moving on to item 11, Director of Public Health Recruitment. Councillor Holden, would you please introduce the report that, you can, that can be found on pages 33 to 52. Members have also been sent a complete version, completed version of, the, of this report last week. Councillor Holden. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. Can you hear me, Mr Mayor? Yes, Kent, loud and clear. Thank you. Uh, this evening, we're appointing our Interim Director of Public Health and commencing the process to appoint a substantive individual to the role. We're very fortunate to have Joe Broadbent joining us, who's a very high caliber individual. And obviously during this period of COVID, we're very fortunate that we are able to make a appointment for Director of Public Health. 
uh, as someone who has got an outstanding track record in the field and has in fact previously worked with our current director of public health, Ian Wake, so we can ensure there is a seamless transition as Ian becomes our new director of adult services. So we are fully armed uh, as we go through this COVID process. Um, unlike the last time we appointed a director of public health, uh, the national regime has changed. We have to form a special subcommittee inviting in individuals from Public Health England and from the NHS to join the selection committee. So as you'll see in your papers, we have formed uh, the outline of that subcommittee. Uh, myself as the portfolio holder for social care, Councillor Mays as the portfolio holder for health, and we've invited Councillor Holloway as the official opposition uh, shadow portfolio holder, along with relevant officers and colleagues from Public Health England and from the NHS, so we can make a full appointment. Um, with that, Mr Mayor, I'm uh, happy to open for questions, but assuming there won't be, I'll simply move the recommendations. Right, Councillor John Kent, do you wish to speak? No, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Byrne, do you wish to speak? No, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Massey, do you wish to speak? No, thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Rannan, do you wish to speak? No, thank you, Mr Mayor. Proceed. Would any member like to speak on this report? No. Councillor Holden, do you wish to sum up, please? Simply move the recommendations, Mr Mayor. I will now proceed to the recommendations. Is any member in disagreement with the rec recommendations made? Right, we're not, not we're not getting any uh, disagreements here, so uh, the uh, appointment is agreed. Moving on to item 12, local council tax scheme. Councillor Hebb, would you please introduce the report that can be found on pages 53 to 58 of the agenda? Certainly, Mr. Mayor, and thank you. Tonight, instead of adding uncertainty to an uncertain world, the paper in front of us tonight seeks to provide some certainty and provide another £8.5 million worth of funding to support the local council tax support scheme, which helps for the father's most vulnerable get a discount of their council tax by up to 75%, depending obviously on personal criteria. Councils must maintain a or must have a minimum criteria, Mr Mayor, in their LCCS scheme. The government have directed that all low-income pensioners will be protected under a national framework as defined by the, the LEN, uh, Department of Community Development. Consideration for protection for vulnerable working age groups will be allowed. An each authority scheme will maintain work incentives, of course, wherever possible. And as such, the scheme in front of us proposes additional benefits for certain low-income persons in Farrakh's population. The first £25 per week of earned income is disregarded when calculated levels of council tax. People can benefit from the scheme by having up, having savings up to £6,000. For working people, they may be able to claim 75% of their full council tax bill. Child benefit and child maintenance is not included as income in the calculation. And there is a full disregard of military compensation payments, including war disablement pensions, war widow pensions, and armed forces compensation scheme payments. The Council has previously approved a review of the local council tax scheme only when more was known about the take-up following the introduction of universal credit benefits across the borough area. Universal credit by design as the, the frank and candid benefit of combining multiple forms of benefits into one bespoke payment for individuals and families, depending of course on circumstance. At a point in the future, we will need to ask borough residents to contribute to a review, ensuring that we continue to ensure that the that those who need it most get it and that any duplications in the benefit are considered in the scheme. But today or in the near future, we have ruled is not the time to be doing that. Whilst the government have supported working people in unprecedented ways during the pandemic, we need to embed stability where we can, while we can. This scheme provides important financial help to those that truly need support. 
we have increased the budget to 8.5 million pounds for the system. It's an increase of over 0.7 million on last year's agreed scheme, and that is above the combined total of all the 150 pounds credited to the accounts of those who are claimants under the government's hardship fund last year. The obvious question, of course, is take up post pandemic. There has been an increase so far, but we believe that the increase has been largely deferred. We think by the support of the job retention scheme, which has allowed household incomes to be maintained at circa 80% minimum during the crisis. Furlough, of course, achieved that intended outcome, helping people keep their homes and still be able to pay their bills. At some point, furlough will end. And what the market looks like, what people's habits will look like after 18 months of saving, if some households have jobs to return to which are secure. And that is utterly heartbreaking for working families. So what they're all is hard to plan. So we have made assumptions on the pressure headlines of the current MTFS to account for oversubscribing of the LCFTS scheme rather than allocate a budget window, which may be too little or too much for that emerging need. And my last message is direct to our residents. Please reach out if you are in crisis or you see you're heading in that direction. Like most of us in the chamber, we've all come from households where counter tax can be a burden when the things are going against you. Stress, I stress that help and support is available. Please do reach out. We will always do what we can to assist. Mr. Mayor, uh, the paper is obviously as written as recommendations within, and I'll happily take any questions uh, and move the paper forward. Thank you, Councillor Hebb. Councillor John Kent, do you wish to speak? No, thank you. Councillor Byrne, do you wish to speak? No, thank you. Councillor Massey, do you wish to speak? No, thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Adam, do you wish to speak? No questions, thank you, Mr Mayor. Would any member like to speak on this report? No. Councillor Gerrish. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, while obviously I do um, support this item as it is substantially the, the same as um, the LCTS from um, last year, um, would Councillor Hebb just give the uh, reassurance to councillors that the review of the scheme uh, will be forthcoming in the next year? Uh, clearly, this is something that we discussed at length last year and uh, through overview and scrutiny have, again, um, overseen and, and I think it is very important that that review does happen and importantly uh, seeks the views of those who would um, both use the scheme and operate it to make sure that, that really does reflect the needs that we have in the community. Thank you. Councillor Head. Sorry, a, a software update come up just literally as I was unmuting. Uh, Councillor Gerrish, you raised good points and I know this is a bit of a passion for you and I on this. Our focus this year has clearly been to stabilise the offer, and that is why we've also increased the offer to 8.5 million. But you raise a valid point about the need to engage, certainly in line with the universal credit review and, and way that that's uh, working. There has been occasions this year, Councillor Gerrish, uh, you're probably aware that we, we were close to pushing the button in terms of going out to consult. The year has changed rapidly and dynamically, um, and obviously lockdown one, lockdown two, view that we needed to stabilise and offer the support where and while we can. But you do have an absolute commitment. We are absolutely going to do this at the right time, Councillor Gerrish. And uh, as per usual, I look forward to, to your uh, input and, and work on that as well. I hope that gives some reassurance. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hebb, do you wish to sum up? Only to thank members uh, for their support uh, in supporting some of Farrock's most needy residents and increasing the scheme by 0.7 million to 8.5 million to support the most needy and vulnerable in our borough. Thank you. Thank you. I will now proceed to the recommendation. Is any member in disagreement with the recommendation made? No. So the recommendation is approved. 
Moving on to item 13, to receive reports from Cabinet members. The first report on the agenda of Councillor Gledhill, the Cabinet Member for Public Protection and Antisocial Behaviour, has been withdrawn this evening due to his illness. Item 14, the second report is of Councillor Watkins, the Cabinet Member for Environment, Sports and Leisure. Councillor Watkins, would you please introduce your report? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Can everyone hear me? All I can. Okay, excellent. Uh, if, if a few people nod, I'll, I'll continue. Um, so good evening to uh, the virtual chamber as well this evening. Um, this is my fourth annual report as the portfolio holder for environment. Initially, I'm delivering this under very diff different and difficult circumstances on the backdrop of a global pandemic. Firstly, I'd like to thank our amazing workers, from those on the front line, to those in the offices for their work this year. It has been difficult, and whilst we are still gripped in the midst of this terrible disease, we continue to face these difficulties, and I thank each and every member of staff for their work. And I would also like to add um, and pass on my thoughts and well wishes to all those who are dealing with loss brought on by this pandemic. I thank the residents firstly for their patience over this time. We have had to collect more waste where more people are at home, and we have had to deal with a greater number of parked vehicles across the borough causing more blocked access issues. This has caused a strain on the service along with absence of staff for a number of reasons. We haven't been able to always get it right but the team are working flat out to deliver the best service they can over this time and whilst we are still gripped in the middle of the pandemic and this lockdown we'll continue to ensure we prioritise our uh, um, waste, refuse and recycling over this period and aim to bring the garden service collections back up as quickly as we can. But despite all this since my last report we have been able to successfully roll out the first phase of our communal recycling programme with all council areas now complete. And over the course of this year, year, we will be rolling out for private estates and working with those estate operators and residents. And over this period, our clean and green teams have continued to um, do a fantastic job, continue to ensure we keep the borough tidy. We continue to strive for five and continue to work on improving the areas where we have fallen short over recent years. And these have been part of our plans, not just last year, but also in 2019. The investment we have put into this department has seen a magnificent difference. And over the last two periods in our tranche scores from Keep Britain Tidy, we have seen some of the best scores um, we've ever seen. And we are actually outperforming London and the national average for the rest of England as well. And only last month, we passed the Active Places strategy, which is enabling us to start embarking on real change of sport across Farrock. Whilst it is part of the local plan, we can still make change outside of the plan where funding becomes available. And that is exactly what I want to see happen over the course of this year and years to come. As heard loud and clear through the CGS meeting, I completely agree. I want to see this strategy actually get stuff on the ground and making a difference. And that's why a paper will be going to committees later this year, outlining the work carried out to ensure that each project we do has a thorough consultation and to update members of where we're currently at. And as part of that, after conversations with our sports and community groups, I want us to work closer with them. The team are working on greater collaboration strategies with the Friends of Groups, which have de developed over the last couple of years, and how we can help and support each other. But I also want us to do the same for sport. Whilst we have the plan to ensure we do get it right, I firmly believe we need to collaborate. And um, that's why over the coming months, the team will be working on a, north, a new format we can take forward, similar to the others of the past from different departments, but can ensure we get real input and in our future ideas from those delivering sports on the ground. And this leads me where do we go to in 2021. Of course, in the midst of the global pandemic, we need to get things back to where they once were when we safely can do so. We know it won't be easy, and each day does bring on new challenges. Our guard away service will return when it is safe to do so without putting a strain on our refuse and recycling collections. The HWRC site will return back to normal when we can. And I can announce that after the initial trial of trailer Thursday, um, after conversations with the team and the initial um, response we've got, um, Trailers will now be available to access the site all day on a Thursday on an initial trial basis. There is a lot of complications behind this, which don't unfortunately um, come out so well um, in press releases. And it's due to the safety of the site, both the residents who are attending the site, but also our staff, and to ensure we don't cause any backlogs of traffic on, Buck on Buckingham Hill Road. And we will very closely monitor this with its implementation, but we rightfully want to get trailers and vehicles back on the site at the same time. Um, and obviously, we, whilst we do tackle this pandemic, we'll be working on other projects which are outlined in my report on page 82 of the agenda. Firstly, we have to take on the challenge of recycling and seeing re real recycling improvements. 
whilst ensuring we are taking a, an environment first attitude. We aim on launching a brand new recycling campaign this year, going back to basics and will be aptly named Getting Forrock Recycling. Alongside this, the team have been working hard on delivering an improved misbin, op, um, misbin reporting system, tightening up what we have, taking feedback from both residents and councillors to ensure that we have a smooth, easily accessible and more accountable system in place to ensure that when residents do report miscollections, we can better communicate and resolve them. And as I've outlined, we'll be rolling out the separated food waste collection. There is no date yet set for this. Work will begin on contracts and procurement and we'll be engaging with members on the waste working group on the comms plan for this over the coming year. Um, and obviously we'll continue to listen and receive feedback on how we can always improve our uh, recycling. And I always ask members, if you've got ideas and you want to come forward with it, this is a collaborative process, bring them forward to the table. Um, and to ensure that we're not just sitting um, idly with the achievements we've already made. Can you start to wind through, wind up? Yeah, I'm almost done, Mr Mayor. Um, our team will continue to search for improvements across our streets, cleaning strategies, cemeteries and burial strategies, and also our tree planting strategies. It's something I really want to see over the course of this year with new trees being planted and also new wildflower meadow sites as well being implemented across the borough. I, I will say it's taken too long to get there and we need to see real action on the ground this year. Uh, Mr Mayor, I uh, commend this report. It's, it continues to be a true honour to be able to you know, present this in front of all the members, whether it be in a chamber or virtually. Um, we always do the very best we can and I look forward to taking member, uh, questions from members. Thank you, Councillor Watkins. Uh, Councillor Redsill was chair of the Cleaner, 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 Greener and Safer Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Would you like to speak? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Watkins. Um, I, uh, as chair of the CGS, I would like to, you know, especially with a sports strategy coming forward, um, just can I have your assurance because the um, youth in the borough need sport very much, especially at this time, of, you know, and just when we come out of this COVID, they will need it even more. The coaches and the youngsters do a lot for sport, and I think we need to support them. I, as I said at the CGS, I don't want to see this just on paper and words. I want to see it taken forward. Um, I've been here before. We had a sport strategy before, which didn't um, sort of come forward as it should. But I just want your assurance that you'll follow it up, and it needs to happen. Kids need sport in the borough because it keeps them off the streets. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, oh, can I, yeah. So, um, thank you very much, Councillor, for your question. You are right. Um, that's why I've, I've committed to us saying, but we will bring forward an update to the um, what will be CGS committee at towards the autumn period of 2021, outlining where we're at. And obviously, as the, the most recent thing we went to cabinet by Councillor Garish saw, um, things like to note reports will, know, will hopefully become a thing of the past. So, this will be an actual report coming with groundwork changes which our team are making. An integral part of that, and you do raise a very good point, and this kind of feeds into my um, future ambition about how I want to see sports um, play an active role in the implementation and the communications part of this. Um, obviously, it sits quite well, this all sits within our play strategy, um, which we obviously have as a borough, um, but it's imperative that we get it right. And, I, I, and I've seen across the borough over the years where there are sports facilities which are dilapidated, they are no longer in use, the community don't really see the point of them being there when you do engage with the community about trying to actually get them to do something. Um, there doesn't really seem to be much appetite to do so. And I don't want there to be projects put in for the sake of projects being put in because they look good in the press release. That's not the right approach. It's about ensuring that the sports changes we make will make an actual change to the borough that will be used by the residents within the borough. The sports groups will be able to take them on board and do what they need to do with them. And it's ensuring that we get that right first time. And that's imperative to ensure that this strategy works the way it's intended to do so. But yes, you've got my assurances, but we want to see, and I want to see real change occurring with this, not just words. Thank you. Councillor John Kemp, do you wish to speak? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, can I just start by saying that I'm really disappointed that we don't have the opportunity to go through uh, the, the leader's report and to question the leader. And, and frankly, the, the, I understand that people have issues, people have ill health, they have things that happen. But the leader's attendance at both council and general services committee has been woeful. Uh, they're both at around 50 percent. And frankly, that's just just not good enough. 
Uh, but to Councillor Watkins' report, uh, I was surprised when I read it that there isn't a mention in there of Cabinet's decision to move to fortnightly uh, collection of residual waste. Can you tell us when he expects that change to take place? Councillor Watkins. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. Um, so, uh, thank you, Councillor Kent, for your question um, and obviously highlighting the work which um, your Labour Chair obviously did um, on that committee and brought forward as part of the cross-party working group. Um, as my report outlines, um, the only changes which will be taking place um, in the most recent in the future so far uh, will be the new recycling campaigns to get recycling back to basics and to really be able to help support the residents in knowing how to recycle. Um, the separated food waste collections, which are obviously part of government guidelines that we need to administer by 2023, um, and all other aspects of the waste strategy are currently under review. Thank you. Councillor Byrne, do you wish to speak? Yes, um, thank you. If this report is sound and we really care about sport, well, uh, is it fair to say you'll be writing in stone that things like Corringham Athletic will continue to play football at the Manor Way and you will stand up against anything Shell wants to throw at us and will you give us a guarantee that them pitches will be safe or is it just talk? But say we need to tell Shell basically to do one and keep our youth playing football for a, for a teams like that and this probably happened everywhere else in Farrah but our local Coronel Athletic it's about kids it's about sport so will you stand up for them and fight for them uh, Councillor Watkins uh, the answer to that is yes um, as I've already committed but we need to see a uh, real sporting change and it doesn't also mean um, destroying the sports groups which we don't currently do have Councillor Massey do you wish to speak Okay, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Adam, do you wish to speak? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and thank you, uh, Councillor Watkins, for your report. Very pleased to uh, follow your vision regarding the trees. We can't, we can't get enough of those planted. But uh, the sports strategy, I, I just want to touch on that. Uh, and the improved sporting opportunity. Now, we've had some great news just recently that Tilbury Football Club is going to be having its new stadium, which, uh, you know, is going to have its community use as well, which is great. Uh, but do you think, Councillor Watkins, that it's time that Council offered Grays Athletic the opportunity to continue their great work with youngsters? <laughs> Yes, I'm um, sorry, is that the end of the question? I, I presume so, yes. Um, so, thanks. I saw someone message about not going to have to get their full question in, so I just wanted to confirm that wasn't yourself from Councillor Allen. Um, yes, so from the Grays Athletic point of view, of course, uh, we are obviously working with them. I've had conversations with them in the past, I know the leader has as well, and so I've other members about getting, obviously, them back to their rightful homes. Um, there are plans in the, as part of the active play strategy. Obviously, there are aspirations as to where we move forward over uh, 2021 and moving over the many years in which this strategy will become, obviously, a key part of that. Um, and obviously, not just Grays Athletic, but the other senior football clubs we do have in the borough, including Tilbury, and obviously, fantastic news in their brand new stadium. Absolutely delighted for them. East Park United, you know. Um, and plus, not just football, there are many other sports which we do have, which do need to see um, further love, but also the other sports um, who have may have vacated the borough over recent years, we need to try and bring back and also for cater for the sports which we don't currently have as well. But yes, is the answer. Thank you. Uh, I have further questions. From, are there any other further questions? I've got a question from Councillor Muldowney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Watkins, for your report. Um, back in June 2019, at a council meeting as a new councillor, I asked you um, if the council would commit some money to improve the old and deteriorating play equipment in Chadwell's parks. At the time, you personally assured me that Chadwell parks would be shown some love in this municipal year, um, this current year. Unfortunately, as can be seen from your report, 
Chadwell got no love at all this municipal year, although I do note that money was spent in other wards on other parks, some of which have had substantial investment in the past and are also probably due to benefit from you know, a lot of investment going forward into the future. So um, in addition to that, we've been refused, community projects have been refused Section 106 monies. Um, which they could have leveraged to double that investment by using it as match funding with other organisations that are funding um, the projects that they wanted to take forward. So my question is, when will the residents of Chadwell St Mary see the investment that was promised in their parks, in their play, in their sports facilities? Councillor Watkins. So, yeah, thank you very much, Mr Mayor. So we have spent obviously in other parks. That's obviously part of the initial plans. A lot of our plans have changed and had to be put on hold because of the fact that we are obviously fighting coronavirus um, and the services have to change in respect to that. As I've already outlined in my, uh, in my speech, um, we are still tackling the pandemic. It's not like it's gone away and our, our services are back to, to full service. It's not the case. It will get there when it's safely able to do so. Um, in relation to your 106 agreement um, funding, um, I did see obviously what was presented in to the press and um, that has been raised by myself to my team members and um, I would love to know who told you this um, in particular so if you could please pass that potentially confidentially to me if you feel um, comfortable to um, as to where um, you heard that because from, uh, it doesn't seem to be the case the 106 Monday money yes was um, is available for your parks for community use and for the improvements in a particular area that is still very much the case in relation to the reference you mentioned in that particular release about the um, wider strategy, well, that wider strategy just passed last month, and that was the active places strategy. It's all about ensuring that we get the right um, equipment, the right sporting changes in the areas based on the empirical data after years of consultation so that we get it right. And so I can guarantee your residents of Chadwell and also the residents across the entirety of the borough that change is coming and that 106 money, which is earmarked from that developer, which you've referenced to £20,000, will be spent and my team will be in contact about how that will be going ahead. Thank you, Councillor Watkins. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, yes, Councillor Watkins. Um, in Paul's leisure, um, obviously through the pandemic, have had um, a very, um, shall we say, um, their balance sheet must be on its knees. I'd be interested to know, have they approached the council uh, for a financial grant? Councillor Watkins. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, as the councillor will be fully aware, Impulse Leisure is a, it's not part of the council. It is a private company who leases our buildings. Um, it would be wrong for me to say conversations which we are having, and I've had numerous conversations with um, Carl, who is now in charge of Impulse Leisure, um, over the last previous months since he took control. However, what I can say is that we are working with Impulse Leisure in relation to the National Leisure Recovery Fund grant ensuring that um, obviously we can come to a good uh, working arrangement with Impulse Leisure as part of that uh, funding, which has come forward from um, obviously national government. And this kind of touches on the numerous millions of pounds that the, the Conservative government have given uh, Forest Council and councils up and down the country in dealing with this pandemic. Thank you. Councillor Worrell, your question. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I apologise if this was covered in the presentation. Um, I did email Matt to say that I got kicked out. So I actually missed all of your presentation, um, Councillor Watkins. Um, it's just a shame, before I ask my question, it's a shame that um, some parks got some stuff done in COVID and Chadwell St. Mary didn't. I don't know what the difference is geography wise. Um, but my question's about the brown bins. So they was um, stopped, started, stopped, and now they've stopped again. So um, we've got our spring just around the corner and people are going to start venturing back into the gardens again. I know that I'm desperate to, to get out into mine, that you know things have started growing again. Can you assure us that our bins will be back um, ready for... April even, you know, the beginning of April, and that there'll be no attached costs to having our brown bins back. Thank you. Councillor Watkins. Um, so I, I can firmly put 
um, out there, there were no charges uh, for those collections. Um, in relation to when they will be back, it's on a rolling two week notice at this point in time. Obviously, as part of the most recent, part of this lockdown, um, many of our members, and being honest, are shielding, which does put a strain on service along with those obviously coming and going due to not just COVID related issues, there's always going to be other issues that go on, but we also have obviously COVID and the self isolation that does um, come with that. Um, I did say in my speech that, you know, it, it's difficult when we have to make these decisions, it's not easy. Um, we are doing our best to protect the refuse and the recycling collections over this period of time. Um, and we will continue to prioritise those two streams um, over the coming weeks. However, uh, myself and the team are doing everything we physically can, but taking the staff's safety as the main priority here, um, of course, is what we should be doing. Um, and we'll endeavour to get the service back as soon as we can do. As soon as we know that when the service is able to um, sustain a full rollout, um, of a collection round without inflicting upon our refuse and our recycling collections. There will be an extensive communication program in place and the teams are working up different scenarios um, on how we can get the brown, uh, the garden waste collections back in, either on a monthly basis or on a fortnightly basis if necessary or back to how it originally was. But again, it's, a, it's an ongoing situation which we're having to deal with on a daily basis and I can't give no guarantees, but what I can guarantee is that we are doing everything we can. Thank you, Councillor Watkins. We've now exceeded the time allocated for this uh, this section of the, on the agenda, but Councillor Watkins, uh, you've got two minutes if you'd like to uh, sum up. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr Mayor. Um, it's a pleasure taking questions, and uh, members are always more than welcome to uh, ask me a question whenever I want. Um, I'm surprised it's taken over two, uh, to, well, about six months for someone to actually ask me a question about uh, waste collections, but um, that's the opposition these days, unfortunately. But it's a pleasure to be in this particular position. Um, you know, the team have done an absolutely outstanding job over the previous um, year. They continue to do an outstanding job. Um, they are the front line of our council. Um, and my big, biggest heartfelt thanks goes out to them every single day for the work they do. Thank you, Councillor Watkins, for your report. We now move on to item 15, questions from members. Um, questions from members uh, to answer questions from members in the order in which they were submitted. <clears throat> we have up to 30 minutes for this item. There were no questions to the leader and five questions to Cabinet members. These can be found on page 95 of the agenda. Those questions not dealt with at this meeting, the member to whom the question is addressed shall provide a written answer as soon as practically possible after the meeting. <coughs> For the benefit of the recording of this meeting, I would ask those members who have submitted questions to please read out their question when asked to do so. Question one is from Councillor Pothakerry to Councillor Johnson. Councillor Pothakerry. Councillor Pothakerry, can you hear me? Would you like to read out your question? Sorry, it's, it appears that you're on mute, Councillor Pothakerry. No? Move I'll move on to question two and we'll come back to you, Councillor. Councillor two, I was also from Councillor Pothakerry, so uh, unless you can hear me by now, Councillor Pothakerry, can you? I can, I can hear you. Can you hear me, Mr Mayor? We can hear you now. Do you, would you like to go back to question one? Yes, please, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, what is Camp Thurrock Council doing to stop the practice of landlords and letting agencies placing blanket bans on renting to prospective tenants in receipt of housing benefit, known as no DSS, after two county court judges ruled this practice amounted to indirect discrimination on the basis of gender and disability under the Equality Act 2010 in July 2020 and September 2020. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor, for your question. Um, I'd actually be very annoyed, indeed upset, if it were brought to my attention that residents bringing forward their concerns that this may be happening were ignored by the council. However, this act being a, a civil law provision means residents should refer their complaints directly to the county court without need for reference to the council, as Thurrock Council has no responsibility for the enforcement of this act. Whilst it is clear that Thurrock Council has no power to take action in this matter, I would still expect any such reports to be taken seriously and any Thurrock resident pointed in the right direction as to how to get the complainant to court. But I do know there are strict time limits in bringing such claims to the county court and therefore it is important that the individuals seek legal advice and are given that advice by the council. Thank you. Councillor Pottery, do you wish to pose a supplementary question? Yes, please, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to Councillor Johnson for your reply. I've been supporting a family with young children trying to find a home in Greys who have been teetering on the brink of homelessness for well over a year now. Uh, they're finding, um, as a matter of course, that letting agents are still gatekeeping properties upon inquiry with blanket no DSS policies. So they, uh, they are inquire about a property, as soon as housing benefit or universal credit is raised, they're told these properties are not suitable for um, people uh, on DSS and uh, we have no properties that can be let to those um, in aid of public assistance. I think that your suggestion that these families who are in the midst of crisis should be, you know, trotting along to the county court every time a letting agent uh, says no to them is quite frankly not good enough. The council needs to take a lead on this. Will you commit, Councillor Johnson, that the housing department will implement an action plan to er eradicate this unfair practice in Thurrock within the next six months? Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Councillor. It's not my opinion, it's the law. The law says this, this is a civil law provision. Therefore, the, the council has no jurisdiction over it whatsoever. But as I said to you in my first answer, I, I'll be very annoyed if we're not giving legal advice to those particular tenants, which, in all honesty, councillor, that, that is what you should be doing. I'm afraid the council cannot take it to court. It is an individual who needs to take it to court. And what you have to remember is that these particular cases were are only in the county court, so they don't they don't have to be taken uh, into, into the, the the proper law. But because originally it was considered that no DSS policies, which I I disagree with completely, they shouldn't happen. But they were not an actual protected characteristic. So it could still be that it still depends on the the individual getting those benefits, how the court would see it. But it's not something that Thurrock Council could advocate on. It has to be an individual taking it to the court. Councillor Pothecary, do you wish to pose a second supplementary? Yes, please, Mr Mayor. I think, Councillor Johnson, you're suffering from an incredible lack of imagination. The own, the, I'm not suggesting that the council take individual letting agents to court. What I am suggesting is that the council has various levers, various ways it can influence and educate and inform. And there are many, many ways that the council could actually use its influence it's to talk to letting agents locally and make them absolutely crystal clear aware that these policies are not, in fact, legal. The suggestion that individual families should be trying to go to court every single time they try to rent a property when they're inquiring after maybe 20 properties a week in some cases is absolutely ludicrous. Will you please resolve to talk to your officers and see what can be done proactively to say to letting agencies this really isn't on, especially as more and more of our residents go on to universal credit and housing benefit as the coronavirus redundancies bite? Councillor Johnson. Councillor, I'm sorry, I'm not suffering from anything at all other than trying to repeat myself to you. This is the law. It's not something that we can do. I've said quite clearly that I would be very upset if residents of Thurrock bringing this to officers' attention, they're not advised properly. And that proper advice is to seek legal advice because 
That is how they take it to court. And that's how it can be done. It needs to be done in the county court through the civil law provision. They could they, they go and speak to the Citizens Advice Bureau or you know, solicitors if they really need to. But that's the advice that the council can give. If council officers along the way happen to see that these letting agencies have the no, <coughs> excuse me, the no DSS sign on there, then the council will tell them that they've got to take it off. But other than that, the council has no jurisdiction over taking action in this matter. Thank you, Councillor Jeffries. Uh, moving on to question two, which is from Councillor Pothecary. Councillor Pothecary, can you please read out your question as set out on page 95 of the agenda? Thank you, Mr Mayor. In December 2020, a coroner ruled that air pollution was a cause of death of a nine-year-old girl from Lewisham, Ella Kissy Deborah, who tragically died in 2013 during an asthma attack. What is Thurrock Council doing in response to this landmark ruling to protect Thurrock residents from toxic air? Councillor Mays. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I thank you, Councillor, for your question. Of course, the, the case itself is extremely sad. I think any parent uh, who's either lost or has children can uh, never imagine the suffering that that, that would bring um, and, and hearts go out to them, albeit a number of years ago, but the pain will never go away. Uh, in terms of air pollution, it is important that we get on top of it. Uh, that's why my cabinet colleagues uh, agreed earlier this month to look at things such as uh, electric vehicle charging to try and get the vehicles um, cleaner and, and greener. Uh, we've got an anti-idling campaign that has been going on for some time, um, working in collaboration with schools, trying to encourage people to walk to schools if, uh, uh, if they can, uh, because obviously we want to try and keep as uh, cleaner air as possible. And obviously with Highways England trying to build the low attempt crossing and the fight against that, um, it's obviously important that we, we try and do all we can to make sure that the air quality in Thurrock is the best it can be. Councillor Pothecary, do you wish to pose a supplementary question? Yes, please, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Mays, um, for, your, for your response. Um, you've outlined a couple of measures there. Have any of these measures had any de demonstrable impact? because at the moment, as a resident, it doesn't feel like things are getting any better. Councillor Mays. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Councillor, for your supplementary. Of course, during the pandemic, it's very difficult to, uh, to quantify that. Um, obviously, we're putting measures in place that will undoubtedly make a big difference, trying to reduce uh, emissions is, is is obviously important and they, they will have an impact. Obviously, how to measure that um, is important, but during this time, uh, that, that wouldn't be responsible because we're not in normal times. So we did at the beginning of last year look at uh, redoing our air quality modelling strategy. Uh, and of course, that would be irresponsible to spend taxpayers' money on this at this moment due to the fact that we are not in normal. So the way that we will uh, check that the things that we're doing are working um, is obviously there is continued air quality monitoring for our AQMA centres. However, we need to uh, review the model because it is, it is very old and, and we need to, to look into that as agreed by the CGS. Um, so at this moment, we can't say you know, absolutely. Our air quality monitors uh, are obviously showing that air quality is better. Um, however, that isn't a true reflective of what the new norm will look like once COVID is over. Councillor Pothecary, do you wish to pose a second supplementary question? Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Mays, um, for your answer, which was, which was incredibly candid. Um, my final question is, uh, is, is slightly long, but forgive me, it, it's really crucial. Yesterday, uh, the Conservative government and a majority of Conservative MPs, including both of our local MPs, voted against an amendment to the Environment Bill, which would have seen the UK adopt the World Health Organization's recommended air quality target of PM 0.25 or less. This would potentially stop the Lower Thames crossing in its tracks. Given the commitment you've made tonight, will you lobby your government to ensure 
the World Health Organization's air pollution targets are enshrined into UK law and avoid preventable deaths and serious illness from air pollution in Thurrock. Councillor Mays. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Councillor, for your second supplementary. Obviously, how things and votes go in Parliament can often be uh, headline grabbing, so we got to look at details of, of what was exactly said and done, and I, I appreciate, obviously, you've picked out bits there, but sometimes bits on the whole picture. But I do think uh, it is important, as I said, for air quality to be improved. That's why I do think we should all get behind uh, our um, Thames Freeport bid uh, to make sure that we can look at getting really, really good improvements for our borough on top of what we can do with things like electric river transport, hydropower, battery powered cars, uh, the, the fantastic if we could get the use of the river and take people off of the roads. These are the sort of things that we can all do to push and try and make things better for Thurrock rather than trying to get a something through in Parliament that may just be symbolic rather than actually uh, detailed in how we actually improve things for our borough. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mays. Uh, Councillor Shinnock, please read out your question as set out on page 95 of the agenda. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, Councillor Mays, can you please inform me if we, there are any plans for Thurrock to have COVID-19 marshals going around the borough? Councillor Mays. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Councillor, for your question. There are COVID marshals going around the borough. Um, in fact, uh, we received £93,000 of funding from the government um, a few weeks ago, and we are um, in the first week of working with our uh, partners to deliver this. Um, there are 64 businesses that were visited in the first week alone, uh, and 74 members of the public that was offered advice on how to promote COVID safety measures. So the answer is that there are COVID marshals. Thank you. Councillor Shinnock, do you wish to pose a supplementary question? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to ask uh, Councillor Mays, are any of these marshals being deployed in South Ockendon? Because I am receiving quite a few uh, complaints about things that are going on over there with guarding masks and things in the shops. Councillor Mays. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you for your supplementary. Uh, in terms of wares, um, I, I, I can check that and come back to you. However, um, I do think it's important to take this opportunity to, to remind residents that we can all play our part in shops, in and around, in, when we're at work, follow hand space, uh, face space, just make sure we wear our masks, do the right things, uh, and we can all get through this as quick as possible. Councillor Shinnick, do you wish to pose a second supplementary question? Um, I'd just like to Councillor Mays to get back to me on that, you know, and let me know if this is happening in Ockendon. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Shinnick. I'm sure Councillor Mays will do so. Moving on to question four from Councillor John Kent to Councillor Hooley. When will the report of the Communications LGA peer review carried out last October be published? Councillor Hewlin, please answer the question. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Councillor, for your question. The report will be published as part of the Corporate Overview and Scrutiny Committee agenda papers in March. Thank you, Councillor John Kent. Do you wish to propose a supplementary question? Yeah, can I ask what the hold-up has been in bringing that forward? The review was took, took place, as I've said, in, in October. Having to wait as long as March seems an extraordinarily long time. What, what, what's the hold-up then? Councillor Hewley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor, again for your question. Yeah, it, it does, but there's been no deliberate delay at all. The review, as you say, was carried out in October, but the final report was only received from the LGA mid-December. The LGA recommended we formulate an action plan on how and when recommendations can be implemented, including the development of the new communication strategy. And as you know, at the same sort of similar time, government guidelines and regulations changed rapidly 
and um, those changes went on into January and it was necessary for the comms team to get focus on the incredibly hard job of ensuring residents and local businesses receive that latest information and advice. So the, agenda, the work on the plan and the strategy will take place throughout February and uh, then it will be ready to bring to overview and scrutiny to make comments for input and recommendations in March. Councillor John Kent, do you wish to pose a second supplementary? No, that's fine. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Moving on to question five, which is also from Councillor John Kent, and this is to Councillor Coxall. Councillor John Kent, please read out your question as set out on page 95 of the agenda. When does the portfolio holder expect planning application 18 stroke 01671 stroke full in respect of the land at Arena Essex to be determined? Councillor Coxall, please respond to the Thank question. You. Thank you. The application was submitted in November 2018 and during the course of 2019, the statutory consultees confirmed they had no objections, with the exception of Highways England who required a transport modelling to be undertaken. Once this is complete, uh, we are still waiting for it to be completed, as I understand, from the applicant, we will consult Highways England again, and hopefully they will lift their objection. As this process now, now does draw to close to an end, Highways England lift their objection, I understand the planning committee will determine the application by the summer of this year. Councillor John Kent, do you wish to pose a supplementary question? Th thank you, and that's that's helpful. Uh, the portfolio holder will be more than aware that as a result of uh, the, the change of ownership of, of the land there, the Lakeside Hammers Speedway Club have, have lost their home. Uh, will the portfolio holder undertake to push for Lakeside Hammers to be rehomed re within the borough as part of this application? Um, I would... Thank you. I, I, as you know, I, I was a regular visitor. Maybe you didn't um, to that Lake Tahoe. In fact, I was honoured to be there on the last night. We had we there. We were there. Um, it's really important. It was the premier team here regularly on Sky News, the Sky Sports. Um, I'm disappointed we can't get here there. The local planning team and I have met Thurrock Lake Thur Hammers on numerous occasions over the past few years to encourage them to get involved, get involved in the preparations for the new local plan and look at opportunities for a new venue in Thurrock and, the, and an application if the application of Arena Essex is successful. And I, I really do hope they do find a venue. It is a very difficult, obviously we, um, quite a few people upset. It's very noisy to, uh, to the people around. And now I think Legside Hammers realise that. But uh, I would want them to stay in Thurrock. Um, and I, I'm hoping that we can make sure they do stay here. Um, with the, like, so as soon as, soon as Thurrock Hammers can get back, the better. Councillor John Kent, do you wish to pose a second supplementary question? Yeah, again, that's helpful. And the portfolio holder will be more than aware that our current uh, planning policies, particularly policies uh, PMD5 and CSTP9, uh, mitigate in favour of not losing sports clubs uh, when developments happen. In particular, CSTP9 says to only allow, allow the loss of a particular facility where appropriate alternative provision can be made elsewhere. Does the portfolio holder believe that that would give members of the planning committee uh, enough cover to refuse a planning application for Arena Essex that didn't take into consideration the future of Lakeside Hammers? And that you're getting into a planning committee conversation that I wouldn't want to get to here in a point of law, that's quasi-judicial. I not going to go i'm not um in, in, going to get venture that far you're not going to push me there but what i can say is um the the uh, the applicant needs to con con be in negotiations with the uh lakeside hammers or thorough hammers now uh, to make sure that, that that is part of their application whether that's financial or something thank you moving now on to item 16 Reports from members representing the council on outside bodies. I understand that councillor, but I understand that you would like to provide an update on the Mucking Charitable Trust. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me? Faintly. Faintly. Well, let's see how we go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
uh, as nominated by this council, I am a, a, one of the trustees of the Mucking Charity Trust, so the MCT. That is a charity which manages an endowment set up in 2011 to fund the cost of running the Thameside Nature Park in Mucking for a period of up to 99 years. Um, I'm wishing to provide an update to Council on events concerning the future management of the funds held by the MCT. In September 2018, the trustees of the MCT proposed to pass the responsibility for safeguarding the restricted funds of the MCT to the director, directors of the Thameside Nature Park Limited, the charitable company responsible for managing the Thameside Nature Park, but not the visitor centre housed in the park. It was further proposed by the trustees of the MCT that once the responsibility for safeguarding the funds and transfer of the balance of funds all in compliance with the rules of the Charity Commission had been made to the Thames Nature Park, that the MCT would be wound up and some of the present trustees of the Mucking Charity Trust would join the, the board of the Thames Side Nature Park. This, the view that amalgamating the effort would clearly be beneficial for both parties. There's been a lot of months of endeavour on the part of the trustees for the MCT, um, but sadly negotiations haven't been successful. And consequently, the trustees of the MCT have decided not to pursue this at the current time, although, of course, remain open to future possibilities if they arise. After the closure of negotiations and recognition of common practice within charities these days, the trustees of the Buckingham Charitable Trust have taken the opportunity to review the makeup of their trustee board. And that is largely the reason why I'm talking tonight. As a result of that review, which was carried out at the end of November last year, the trustees of the trust decided to move the responsibilities and duties for the chairman position of the MCT by appointing a paid for trust company, Croatia's Trust Corporation Limited. That new arrangement commenced on the 1st of January this year, and four out of the five current trustees on the MCT will remain. The key change is that the MCT will now be chaired by a professional body, which will ensure best practice in line with ever changing requirements of the Charities Act and will work alongside the lay trustees who continue to pursue the wishes of local people in all matters. Following completion of the changes, the MCT is still in good shape and in line with the original endowment is ready to continue to provide financial support to the Thameside Nature Park for many years to come for local residents. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hibb. Councillor Redsaw, I understand you wish to give a report. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Um, the police I sit on the police and fire and crime panel, um, but just to say that the commissioner has given you a lot of advice tonight. Um, it was just to give you some more information of all the good work that's been achieved, um, that we don't hear enough of that. Uh, more than 21 million worth of Class A drugs and 1.85 million in cash has been seized um, in Essex as part of the serious crime um, directorate as part of an international um, operation targeting serious and organised crime. So a lot is being done on that that we don't always hear. Um, much is being done under the radar, so it needs to be out there so residents know um, what's being achieved um, by our force. We also need to get out there that we've got trained police coming through in the community and they will come through the system but I've cut mine a bit short because the commissioner gave you quite a bit of information tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ritzel. I understand, Councillor Coxall, you want to uh, give a report? Yes, I, I, I think it was I, apt as it's very close to handing in both the Grey's board and the Tilbury board, which I sit on as cabinet member. I thought we would let, let them know there's some fantastic projects coming through these, and I'll just list them. There's two new jetties which the which the the boards will, will plan to deliver, which for for a new um, hopefully electric um, clippers um, into central London and over to anywhere across the into Kent, matching it much easier. A youth centre, hopefully run by Onside, will be built into Tilbury. The um, we will then into Grays, hopefully a, a river activity centre will be built and just to put river activities on the shore floor to make sure we can enjoy that and have people in the middle of Grays can enjoy a river activity centre. Bringing back two new beaches, one in Tilbury and one in Grays. They've been uh, moved away over years and years. Hopefully we can get nice sandy beaches back in Tilbury and Grays. And a new outside and a revamp of Grays Beach, uh, the actual Grays Beach Park, into a new play centre, so updated cafes, and a new uh, and hopefully a new outside ent uh, entertainment centre. 
um, for the youth to use and the older people. So there's been a reason to go into there. And then hopefully there's some work around the fault to develop the fault to make sure um, with it and to deliver. And we can hopefully we can deliver our two faults way. So there's some great things there. It's 25 million pounds for each uh, each town. Um, so that would move forward and hopefully the we should find out for, if the bids go in in February, we should find out by the summer if we can start moving forward with business cases. Thank you, Councillor Coxall. Does any other member who represents the council and outside bodies wish to present a report? <clears throat> Moving on to item 17, minutes of committees. These are listed on the agenda contents page. <clears throat> item 18, motions update report. The next item can be found on page 97 to 98 of the agenda and is an update on ongoing motions to council. Moving on to item 19, motion. Motion one, um, Councillor Anderson, do you wish to propose and then speak to your motion as printed on page 99 of the agenda? You have five minutes if you wish to do so. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. Can you hear me all okay? Yes. Fantastic. Um, I, I will be, uh, be quite brief, Mr Mayor. Um, this motion simply recognises the seriousness uh, of the challenges we face with regard to the prevent agenda uh, and of course uh, importantly also makes particular mention uh, of illegal entry and unaccompanied asylum seeking children um, and the modern day slavery implications that, uh, that these can entail. Uh, but really Mr Mayor uh, this motion just looks to give members uh, here in this council the opportunity to scrutinise and discuss these issues in an appropriate forum. Uh, it's, it's my contention that although we have a uh, prevent members working group at the moment. This does not quite reflect the, the need to scrutinise these particular issues to the extent required. Uh, Thurrock is a, a port locality um, and, and therefore unfortunately knows all too well of the seriousness uh, that illegal entry, for example, uh, to highlight uh, one of the issues encompassed in the motion really is. Um, and I think that the proper facilitation of these conversations uh, and this scrutiny will not only serve the communities that we represent, uh, but also those intensely vulnerable people that sometimes come into our care. At the moment, for example, um, reports on unaccompanied asylum-seeking children uh, would likely go to children's ONS, I would have thought. Uh, then separately, you have the Prevent Members Working Group. And then on top of that, you've got some other issues uh, in this motion that may well go to other committees of council. Uh, this motion seeks to create one committee uh, that, that would have the opportunity to focus on these issues uh, within their particular context and, and how they may or may not interact with each other uh, and hopefully just give um, members a more joined up picture and approach um, for, for, for these these issues. Um, as the comments from the monitoring officer outline, um, this this will require an amendment uh, to the constitution and so a report will, uh, will be taken to the General Services Committee uh, in the event that, that this motion passes. Um, so, so this will just get the ball rolling as it were begin that process, um, but I hope that this, this beginning of the process is backed by enough members here tonight. Uh, th these are really important issues, um, and I'll, I'll leave it there, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Would a seconder please indicate by raising their electronic hand? Councillor Howden, would you like to speak now or reserve your right to speak until later in the debate? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I reserve my right. Thank you. Does any does any other member wish to comment on the motion? Not seeing any. Council Coxwell. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just. It, this, this is apt on, on tonight. I think Councillor Holloway mentioned the sad 
uh, part, death of and, and, and murder of uh, tw 39 uh, asylum seekers, and uh, we don't know where they were going afterwards. We know there's been issues around, um, if you mentioned in the court case, around they were holding um, in, in all sits. There's been some arrests previously in, around in the in the in the in the all sit farms and outside into industrial sites out in the, in the all sit area. So I, I'm just very pleased this is, and I think this answers some of Councillor Holloway's questions from earlier about the police. We can we have to do something ourselves and to get that moving forward to see that to work together to make sure that there's um, this human trafficking in modern day slavery because that's what's bringing these people from all across right the way world and we've got this port sector we're going to grow we've had a new port open last year if we get the Tilbury free ports and the free ports massively increase we're increasing traffic across Dover we are now going to become more of a target um, and we've got to as a council take responsibilities even if we can't move forward at a pace I think this is a great opportunity to make sure off members are fully aware across the whole aspects of this, where it affects all planning issues, it affects the full issues, it affects a, a, a vast amount. And I think um, a, a changing the constitution to deliver this is an important aspect and bring prevent in and make it highlight it properly. Councillor Ryan, I understand you'd like to speak. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'd just like to say I fully support these uh, these very serious issues to be to be scrutinised, and uh, uh, that it will give councillors a chance, you know, to uh, dis discuss uh, it at full length. You know, uh, we we have got various ports, uh, you know, Tilbury, Perthley is one of concern. Uh, so yes, I absolutely support this. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Right, uh, at the moment, it appears nobody else wishes to speak on this matter. Councillor Halden, would you now like to uh, speak as a seconder of this motion? Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'll simply say it's, it's very good to see uh, clearly that there, there is not opposition to this motion. Um, whilst we have an informal working group, much like the old corporate parenting informal working group that members will recall, it creates tremendous difficulty because outside agencies don't know formally who to engage with. They can't engage with an informal working group. And more to the point, these issues, these are things that affect all 49 of us as elected representatives of the borough. As it currently stands, there's only one person who has the right to see the list of unaccompanied asylum seeking children and the cases around them and that currently is me and that shouldn't be the case this should be uh, something that all members can engage with all members like uh, councillor holloway mentioned earlier should be able to demand to see a work plan so they can see how their issues are being acted upon and if they've got a thought that they wish to register they know the forum that they can appear at and have it conducted in that professional manner yeah i'm, I'm a firm advocate of there should always be the correct fora to ensure that members can tip a rock over and look underneath it, or as Council Cottrell says, have the, the disinfectant that is sunlight. And I think that's what this um, I think that's what this motion addresses. And when this motion does hopefully pass this evening, I would encourage all members to engage in the work of this new committee to help formulate its work plan to ensure that we do give these things the status that they deserve, put members in the driver's seat, and actually provide that strong body that scrutinises these issues that are so important to safeguarding, so important to make sure that some of these young people who come in aren't the victims of modern slavery um, and such, and engage in that body of work. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Alden. Councillor Anderson, do you wish to sum up? Uh, am I on mute? No, I'm not. Fantastic. Um, no, I'll, I'll just... Um... Uh, I'd just like to move move the motion, please, Mr. Mayor, and have the vote. Thank you. Are members in agreement with the motion? Great. Yeah. In that case, the motion is passed, and that uh, brings us to the end of the meeting. So. That concludes the business of the meeting this evening and I now declare the meeting formally closed.
thank you all for your attendance.